Well, why don't we open up with an Ave and then uh, just get going? Are we all ready? Yep. In yep. the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in mulieribus et benedictus fructus ventris tu, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in hora mortis nostrae. Amen. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> well, with chapter three, we end the, the first part of the text. And so I would recommend going back and looking at the uh, overall structural moments of the of the entire text, because as you'll find reading, uh, many themes are taken up again and again in a different context. And so this is this kind of uh, recapitulative process that I think it was inherent to Father Peter's Bonaventurian mind, but also um, a product of the writing itself of the text over many years. And it was very difficult to because I, I guess from my perspective, every recapitulation, and I'm sure you guys see this as, as you're reading it and as you've read it, uh, every recapitulation has new insights. And so it's very difficult to extract or remove the recapitulations, even if they seem like repetitions, because they do contain new insights and they are situated within a, a kind of broader framework as the whole argument is moving along. So um, I, I feel in some sense it's, it can be frustrating uh, for the reader, but also it's very helpful for a contemplative type of engagement with the text because you, you're continually seeing themes being uh, re-examined and represented throughout the, uh, the progress of the argument. So that's something to note. Uh, in this chapter, we go over some things that we've already touched upon. And I think that is strategic, it's stylistic, but it's also, it seems to be a function of, of Father Peter's own mind, especially with a large text that he was working uh, on over the course of, uh, of over a decade. So I think that's, that's part of the, the difficulty in the text. So you, if we can bear with uh, Father Peter, I think even the recapitulations or perhaps even especially the recapitulations will uh, bear uh, fruit and be rewarding. I'm just going to go ahead and share this screen. Let's see if I can do that. And then we'll get with the uh, the actual presentation. Let's see here. Um, okay. That'll work. All right. So I've done another uh, PowerPoint. Let's see here. I hope that one shows up. Okay. Can you all see that? Yes. Okay, good. Let's see. Now I'll go into uh, just start from the beginning. All right. Uh, Theologian of Auschwitz, uh, chapter three. Okay. <clears throat> so in this chapter, uh, Father Peter moves into a direct discussion of how the cause of the Immaculate, um, meaning the, the defense or the explanation of the Immaculate Conception in terms of the formulation of the doctrine, uh, pertains to the charism of the Franciscan order, specifically in terms of its first page and second page, the first page being the terminus arrival, point of arrival uh, in the definition of the dogma itself, and then the second page being the uniquely uh, the uniquely um, Colbian re reception of the development of the Franciscan charism and its mission being the incorporation of the Immaculate Conception in every aspect of the life of the church. And so in this sense, we can see St. Maximilian and Father Peter as he interprets St. Maximilian uh, dealing with uh, metaphysical grounds the theological grounds, especially concretely the absolute primacy of Christ in a Marian mode, the Immaculate Conception, and then the notion of the inter interplay between uh, metaphysics, uh, especially exemplarist metaphysics as understood concretely in theology as typology uh, terminating and representing concrete individuals. <clears throat> and then through this analysis, a, a way to understand the meaning meaning of history through the development of doctrine, especially the understanding of how Our Lady relates to the Holy Spirit, how Our Lady relates to the Father, how Our Lady brings forth the Word, and then in the next phase, or the other aspect of Our Lady, being the um, first member, and not just first member, but primary member, because Immaculate Conception and Cause 
of the whole Christ head and members, the, 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 shaping and understanding and framing of the church as an institution as it develops through history and as it deepens and applies uh, the the realities of the revelation in and through christ the one teacher of all in a marian mode so um <clears throat> that's what that's what uh father peter understands saint maximilian to be doing and this chapter obviously takes on uh, consideration of the cause of the Immaculate as the heart of the Franciscan charism and uh, <clears throat> is based upon an understanding that St. Maximilian is continuing appropriating, recapitulating that initial mission given to St. Francis, which was particular, particular to St. Francis. It radiated out through his order and thus has both a, an ecclesiological and ecumenical, as well as finally, in, 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 in a third point, a cosmological approach, and that is rebuild my church. And so St. Fran Francis understood his mission to be a rebuilding of the church. This is the mission of the Franciscan order. And St. Maximilian understands that this rebuilding of the church is still the mission of the Franciscan order, implicitly at, at, at least with St. Francis in a Marian mode, and then very explicitly through the cause of the Immaculate and the articulation and application of the two pages of the history of the Franciscan order. So it's not something unique to or exclusive rather to the Franciscan order, but it is something concretely characterizing the Franciscan order. And this is the specific articulation of the, the place of Our Lady in the plans of God from eternity and in the outworking and incorporation and application of those plans in the context of the church. And so there's a, a very concretizing, which is perfectly uh, appropriate to Franciscan uh, theology and thought, both philosophy and um, theology, as well as the um, aspect of the orientation being for the sake, uh, leavening embedded within at the heart of the entire church and thus the entire cosmos. So Father Peter then begins uh, his analysis by, by stating three basic points that we've already touched upon, but are, are absolutely essential to understanding the theology of St. Maximilian Col Colby as a reception and interpretation of the Franciscan tradition within the broader context of the history and development of the, of the entire life of the church, especially um, magisterial, uh, scriptural, and sacramental. And so the first point is, is obviously Colby's theology must be understood as Trinitarian. Well, clearly, and this is, is important because uh, Colby develops his understanding based upon, in the first place, uh, St. Francis's insight into the mother of God, Mary, the mother of God, Our Lady, the Immaculate, as the firstborn daughter of the Father, the spouse of the Holy Spirit, and mother of the Word incarnate. Of course, Bonaventure will take those themes and develop them and apply them and extend them. Um, but in the first point, then, we must say that understand that Col Colby's theology is primarily Trinitarian, not just Trinitarian in terms of uh, what we might consider classical Trinitarian topics, like the questions pertaining to nature, persons, appropriations, uh, apparitions, those aspects, but also through a, a specifically scotistic coloration of St. Bonaventure, making, I think, explicit what's in St. Bonaventure when he talks about the exemplary ideas not just what God knows as possible, but what God actually wills to take place in the economy, that extension of the Trinity ad extra. In terms of the Scotistic uh, analysis, not just Scotus, but later Scotist theologians, especially in the great 17th century, of an analysis of the signs of the divine will, which boils down to and is clearly articulated in that one famous line in um, in a, in a fabulous Deus, uh, that Mary was predestined with her son in one and the same decree. So you get out of this an analysis on the metaphysical level of the, the order of divine intentions, and those, that order of divine intentions is concretely revealed in the absolute primacy of Christ in a Marian mode, which carries within itself a postulate of Mary as immaculate conception in order to be mother of God. Um, <clears throat> And so that's, that's, that's an important aspect. And this is all thoroughly uh, Trinitarian. 
Um, a second key point is to understand that the Colby, the character of Colby's theology is that of St. Francis. Now, I don't remember on what page in chapter three, but uh, Father Peter, in discussing Colby, uh, cites a passage from, I think, uh, the Colby's works number 1360 in relation to the itinerarium as the method of a method of theology is to begin in the method of prayer unction and then in 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 uh, saint bonaventure there's um allusions to the magnificat which is an implicit framing of saint bonaventure of the, the theological project and the whole reality of this journey of the mind into god in a marian mode well saint saint maximilian makes that explicit that's an important aspect because for uh, Father Peter and the, the, the bulk of Franciscan theologians as being recipients and um, agents of the passing on of the Franciscan tradition in terms of its founding vision in a theological mode, well, that's rooted in St. Uh, Bonaventure. Bonaventure takes St. Francis's mystical and practical insights and intuitions and then translates them into uh, a verbal and intellectual mode so that so that then others can take part of this not just on a personal basis but that this can be formulated and taught and expressed in an evangelical or mission oriented context uh, the second point then <clears throat> to to note in addition to uh, this mirroring between uh, St. Bonaventure and St. Maximilian, implicit in Bonaventure in terms of the Marian mode, very explicit in St. Maximilian in terms of the Marian mode, is uh, two statements from St. Francis on the place of erud erudition and learning. And this is an important aspect for Father Peter, <clears throat> is uh, St. Francis said, let those who are, are, are unlearned not seek to learn, but let, lo let those who do have knowledge and the faculty to study the scriptures, study theology, to always do it, maintaining a spirit of piety and devotion, not uh, curiosity and idle speculation. And so that's kind of one bookend. And the other bookend is, of course, St. Francis's later work, I think uh, 12 later letter, uh, I think around 1224 to St. Anthony, where he says, yes, teach theology, but again, do it in terms of a spirit of piety and devotion, not idle curiosity. Um, <clears throat> and so I think Father Peter is taking from this that uh, St. Bonaventure rightly understood that theology is essentially postulated by uh, the, the Franciscan way of life because the Franciscan way of life is radically apostolic. And the radically apostolic life includes the notion of the full orb and a range of the powers of the created person, namely memory, intellect, and will. And if you're going to move from memory, the source, namely, namely the father of lights, to this affective volitional union in the spirit through the son with, in, in, in return to the father, there must be this mediating mode of discourse, something that allows us to engage and work upon understanding, deepening, and articulating what the Father actually has revealed through the Son. And this is the place of intellect as a power, as a perfection of the soul, but it's also <clears throat> as a specific role in the life of the church as work. Work in its natural mode being actually the highest mode of, of, of created activity, created um, vocation, the vocation to do labor and to work for the sake of the kingdom but it's 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 primarily transfigured or specifically transfigured through the light of faith and so um what the what saint bonaventure articulates and that saint uh, maximilian uh, carries on is that there is a proper role of theology even or for theology in the life of the franciscan order for the sake of the church in uh the, the intellectual component, namely theology as such. So there is a place of theology because theology is an act of intellect, which is a natural power, and it takes on the form of work and as work in terms of the exercise and use of the most noble natural faculty and natural power, it has an appropriate place in the Franciscan order as an ascetical discipline and ascetical discipline in order to unify um, memory, that fontal source 
of created spiritual activity with affection or love, that terminus or complement, which creates unity and, and establishes and finalizes a certain kind of order. So theology is needed in order to foster true contemplation. It's, it's in a sense, brings us up to the point of moving from or to uh, acquired contemplation to um, infuse contemplation. And then finally, the third point is that um, <clears throat> Francis's theology takes on a new form in, in Colby, precisely where Colby understands that if there was this intellectual component in the Franciscan order in clarifying and articulating the, the mystery, the fundamental mystery of, of, of Our Lady as the Immaculate Conception, then the second page is not a jettisoning, jettisoning of the theological or intellectual component, but rather in good Bonaventurian terms, recapitulating the theological and contemplative aspects into the, the mission aspects, such that the entire church and through the church, the entire world becomes uh, contemplative. And this is the incorporation of the truth of the Immaculate Conception, both as a dogma, as it relates to all other areas of theology and philosophy in the intellectual realm, but more importantly, as that dogma shapes and informs and influences through the concrete action of Our Lady as Immaculate Conception, Mother of God, and thus dispensatrix or mediatrix of grace in the life of the church and the development of the church, so that the church gives birth to Christ again spiritually, <clears throat> uh, corporately, and individually, so that that church becomes in the process of bringing forth Christ. When Christ is brought forth in maturity in the church, that church will then be rendered fully immaculate, like the first member and <clears throat> subordinate cause, not clause, of the church, namely Mary herself. And so this is this is this this aspect of incorporation entails mission and activity in order to bring about this broader contemplative reality so that the church to the extent that moving from a state of sin to no sin to ex to the extent that that's possible in comparison to always being full of grace and thus without any sin to the extent that it's possible for the church to appropriate and to approximate and to approach Our Lady, that is the, the goal. So uh, St. Maximilian understands then that Francis's theology is for the sake of mission in order for there to be achieved contemplation, in order for this contemplation to have undergone a full purification, full illumination, and thus full union through the created, uncreated immaculate conception, and, and thus the entire, the whole Christ, the head and members becomes immaculate, like the head and the mother are immaculate and the new Eve are immaculate. <clears throat> and so those are, those are three key points in understanding how uh, Father Peter is interpreting St. Maximilian, and St. Maximilian gives us every ground to interpret him in this way, gives Father Peter every ground to interpret him th this way. So the, the key question is, though, is because we're in a theological mode, is what is the condition and understanding, the condition of achieving both an understanding of St. Maximus's articulation and reception of the cause of the Immaculate, as well as achieving the reality that the uh, theology is revealing. And so the condition and understanding, again, goes back to this, this aspect of mediation. And it's a two-fold two, two mediation, but Father Peter's framing it specifically within the modern philosophical and theological context. And this is where he articulates and extends St. Bonaventure's um, <clears throat> presentation that the condition of understanding and achieving all of this entails that the church and its members must become wise. They must achieve wisdom. And for St. Bonaventure, this is knowledge or understanding passing into affection. And this is the perfection of the intellect is precisely in understanding, not from without 
love, but understanding from within love. And this, this, this entails then that there must be undergone uh, a process of a sanctification of the intellect. And this is heavily uh, embedded within uh, Franciscan anthropology in terms of the, the relation and order of the powers of the soul as opposed or as distinct from the more typical Aristotelian account. So the issue is, is what is the, the, the cause of the immaculate? What, what are the characteristics of the Colbian reception and presentation of the cause of the immaculate in the um, Franciscan order as the heart of the Franciscan charism? And then how do we uh, come to a deeper understanding of this? And how is it then implemented? And this has to move through a true sanctification of the intellect, especially, but not exclusively, uh, for those who are engaging in theology proper. What we'll see is, is theology in the second mode as academic theology, as opposed to symbolic theology or uh, contemplative theology. And so uh, that's kind of uh, the foundational points to understand that Father Peter wants us to take in when analyzing and approaching uh, St. Maximilian's own uh, theological vision, <clears throat> especially in relation to the the, pro the proposed book. So we've already gone over this a bit, but Father Peter went over it again in, in, this, in this chapter. And so a Franciscan response to Kant, kind of a recap. So the, the issue of the critical question, and the critical question is ultimately, how does the subject, how do we understand the subject in relation to claims of knowledge, claims to claims of to knowledge to having achieved a relationship of representational identity with objects that are not identical to the subject. And so uh, there, there are two points. One is to move towards autonomy and say, there simply cannot be a, a kind of integration. And the other one is to say, no, the question is misframed when you place the, the, the issue of the critical question how the subject relates to the object uh, in terms of intellect, a natural faculty, it's ra it rather presupposes and needs to be frames, framed in uh, the proper use of the will. And then that would entail digging down a little bit deeper into the nature of the intellect, its source and its purpose. Its source being uh, what uh, St. Bonaventure would call divine illumination, Duns Scotus would call the univocal concept of being, and its termination being, again, the achievement through wisdom of this union and order of charity, ultimately what Father Peter would call not the distinction or separation, primarily understood uh, in terms of separation or distinction between economic and imminent, but rather uh, understanding that the economy of salvation is simply the expansion of the Trini Trinitarian life through the incarnation and the missions of the Son and the Spirit in the church, such that the union of persons in the Holy Spirit is extended to include created persons. And through their recapitulative nature and activities of created persons, all of lower creation as such. And so <clears throat> Father Peter will say then the key to the critical question is not trying to resolve it purely in natural causes, but rather seeking to understand how we can integrate intellectual culture, learning, the love of learning, um, religious cult and worship and mysticism with secularity as opposed to secularism. And <clears throat> the issue here is that you have on the one hand, you have intellect, <clears throat> knowledge and religion, but there's a certain order and relation between intellectual culture, religious cult and worship. That needs to be understood. How does, how does, how does learning relate to any kind of mystical experience. So that's one question of re resolving the critical, <clears throat> excuse me, issue. And the other issue is taking then that whole bundle and comparing it with secularity. And for, for Father Peter there in the Franciscan tradition, there is a recognition that this whole nexus or uh, process and reality of the created person in his or her concrete actions, which take into uh, account memory, intellect, and will, and their ordering. This, there is, there is a relation of that whole concrete experience to uh, certain types of actions 
that of themselves considered abstractly don't have a moral note. And so there, there gives a space for choice. Um, and then how do we order certain activities to God or to self? And this is, this is what Father Peter, building upon uh, Bonaventure and Duns Scotus's notion of a neutral act, this act, again, that intrinsically, abstractly considered, is not to be considered uh, praiseworthy or blameworthy, such as, you know, choosing to eat an apple here and now. <clears throat> um, certain kinds of uh, neutral acts can be understood as instances of secularity where there is a point and a, a point where wherein this secularity has to be ordered and integrated towards God or away from God. And this notion of secularity rooted in a neutral act is opposed to kind of the ideology of secularism, which just simply states there is no place for God in culture and society, the development of culture, society, individuals. And so uh, Father Peter and Pope Benedict XVI understood this, is that there is a place for secularity. And this is rooted for the Franciscans in this reality of um, a neutral act, as opposed to an intrinsically good or intrinsically evil act, such as love of God and neighbor and hatred of God and neighbor. Those are two very clear examples of intrinsically good and intrinsically bad acts. There are other acts that don't admit of this and rather uh, find themselves already in an order an order that's based upon the agency and free choice of individuals as individuals and as individuals within a broader social con uh, context. And so secularism is just simply the vision that the critical question is resolved on the basis of nature and thus on the basis of uh, autonomy, whether uh, intellectual or volitional, and thus then on those on that groundwork, then society and individuals are educated and structured um, in order to uh, pursue, pursue ends as autonomous and ultimately uh, as opposed to God. So the key to the, the key to the critical question is answering: How do we understand a the integration of intellectual culture, religious cult, and worship and mysticism within itself, but then all of this in relation to this notion of secular secularity as opposed to secularism. <clears throat> and the, the, the question then, the critical question on a personal level comes down to the problem of, uh, as I have up on the uh, slide, the problem of the personal subjective in the act of, or in any act of assent. How do, how do persons arrive at an approval and an, and an acceptance of a truth claim as they, as they relate to the difficulties of uh, change and mutability in their own mind, in their own judgments, and in the objects that they judge. There's some change or, or mutability. And so the question then says, well, how do we complement these natural processes of abstraction coming to um, ideas that are general, universalizable, on the basis of mutable causes and uh, mutable minds and mutable acts of, of assent. How do, we, how do we understand this? So how do we understand then judgment, what Bonaventure calls de judicatio? Um, and this goes back then to ultimately the, the priority of the person, even in the natural mode, even in the pre-infused uh, graced grace state of being, there is this priority of personal judgment because simply, uh, according to Bonaventure and Scotus's analysis, and Father Peter follows uh, them very closely, uh, abstraction itself doesn't explain, as Newman will argue, inference based upon abstraction doesn't explain ultimately that assent, that unconditional assent and cert cert certitude, because clearly, even when we have a perfect syllogism, it's possible at some point to forget the syllogism and still assent to the, the, the conclusion of the proposition. Um, more uh, importantly, uh, there are certain truths that we believe by faith, wherein there is no uh, formal or logical necessity. There's something else that the person is judging on the basis of. And this is, this is uh, what, what um, Newman calls, Father Peter following Newman calls the illative sense as um, bearing upon this reality of judgment as a complement of abstraction, 
remember abstraction is the termination of the first act of the mind judgment the second act of the mind and it's really judgment again that mediating act in the process of reasoning that is is the the, the mysterious act because it it diagonalizes out so to speak the the merely inferential the merely logical the merely formal the merely structural but yet people can be certain on this base, basis. And is that certitude or is that certainty of certitudes that are not known simply on an evidentiary basis, are those in any way justified or justifiable? And so this is, this is uh, part and parcel to the question of the, the Kantian position versus, or the Kantian critique versus the uh, Franciscan integration. Uh, that brings us to the next point, uh, the question of intellect and autonomy. Um, for Father Peter, clearly there, there is no uh, autonomous spiritual creature for any number of reasons, and uh, we will get into that a little bit later. But the important thing to understand is that while, while intellect and will are formally distinct, meaning they operate in manners that are irreducibly different from one another, they're nevertheless really identical to the one soul. You can't simply say intellection and volition are accidental or even in a sense of absolute ac attributes or accidents or um, uh, properties of the soul. Rather, they're, they, they, they're better, to, better understood as essentially distinct or formally distinct modes of the operation of the one soul. And so you can't conceive of intellection in this Franciscan account uh, in total isolation from volition, and you can you cannot conceive of either uh, in total isolation from what we would call memory. And so, <clears throat> given that that condition that's established by uh, Saint Augustine, but then Bonaventure Scotus following Saint Augustine, you have to then always see intellect and will in a certain ordered relation, and as um, powers that manifest different modes in their highest sense of operation, namely natural, where the object determines the power and volitional or free, where the, the power determines itself towards the object. And so there's, there's this subtle relationship then between intellect and will being unified in the soul in terms of substance, but nevertheless between themselves also having to have a certain order for their proper use. And this will come out as uh, the, the intellect, even though it's a natural power and the object of the intellect determines the intellect in terms of content. Nevertheless, <clears throat> the intellect in its highest function and knowledge as the fruit of the operation of the intellect is simply and essentially to present the object of love to the will, to make present the object of love to the will. And so if that's the fundamental point of the intellect, then the intellect has while a certain perfection as terminating in truth, nevertheless, that termination of truth is, is ordered above and beyond just the perfection of intellection and truth, knowledge of truth, to the presenting of truth as good to the will, making present the truth as good to the will. So thus, the intellect is always ordered towards the fruition of intellect not just simply in a natural act, but in a spontaneous free act, which or whose proper mode is love and love being the <clears throat> desire of the good for its own sake and desire for approving and unity with that um, good. And so we've already touched upon the uh, Franciscan notion of work, but again, this, this takes in both the formal structure of what the work is as a natural activity and then its purpose or teleology as um, presenting or making present the good to the will so that the will can love that, that truth under the aspect of good in an orderly way. And <clears throat> the will is conditioned by the intellect, but the intellect is complemented or perfected by um, the activity of the will itself. And here we see um, clearly uh, easily Easy, easy appropriations to the taxis or order of the Trinity, Father, Son, Spirit, Spirit as complement, the, the Father as source, the Son as mediatory person, the, 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 the Holy Spirit, Spirit proceeds from the Father through the Son, just as the will proceeds 
from memory through intellect. And when there's <clears throat> when there when memory is exemplified or represented in intellect as making present the good to the will and the will freely loving that good, then there is a return to memory through through source expression and culmination, beginning, middle, and end, and a kind of ordered unity of the soul that then mirrors not just the spiritual nature of God, but actually the taxis and in existence or circumcession of the three persons of the Trinity. And then we see this played out in um, the uh, three ways, purgation, illumination, union, um, and the three theological virtues and so on, hope, um, uh, hope, faith, and charity. You see this triadic structure wherein you have an order, you have a basic unity in kind, but you also then have a process or an existing of these things in a spiral type uh, activity that brings individuals, but also the church through the integration of these mysteries ever closer to their source being the Trinity reducible ultimately to the father who, because he's, because he's uh, is God, he speaks a word. And because he is God through that word, he renders the, the, the good, of his own being present to that word and thus uh, spirates spirit as nexus or bond or love. <clears throat> so uh, let's see here. If we if we have if we have you know a basic Franciscan response to Kant through these through a different account of the structure of created rationality and thus a blocking of the independence of a created being and also uh, a rebuttal of the autonomy of intellect and or will from reality or, or from each other, then we, we're, we're, in the, we're in the ballpark of resolving the issue. And the issue isn't resolved then for <clears throat> St. Bonaventure or uh, St. Maximilian or uh, Father Peter or Cardinal Newman, as Father Peter explains them, in terms of justifying through the power of intellection, the very intellection itself. They see that as uh, radically self-defeating. And so in some sense, there is a kind of um, basis or analogy of different faiths, natural faith, supernatural faith. Um, and it's not the supernatural faith for the Franciscans, just like for the Dominicans. And this separates them or distinguishes them, I think in, in some way, from Kantian and Cartesian thought, is that the Franciscans and, and the Thomists agree with each other that the issue of, of natural knowledge, knowledge happening to you, namely abstraction and sensation and abstraction happens. And this seems to work. It's not an issue of accepting the fact that I, when, I, when my eyes are presented with the sensible species to use uh, uh, Aristotelian Thomistic and scholastic terms with the sensible species of a tree, I abstract the idea of a tree through that whole process and there's a representational relation established. That's not the issue for any of them. They say to question that is, is a non-starter and it, 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 it presents to the world a certain kind of psychological imbalance. Uh, because there really seems to be no uh, good reason to question that. It's rather, once we have the fact of abstraction, how do we relate to all of this reality that we see outside of ourselves as persons? And so ultimately, it's an ascent to the notion of being, being as a judgment that there must be some sort of um, unifying cause or notion that undergirds all of our particular or punctuated sensory experiences. But that ultimate judgment about being takes up within itself subjectively what, uh, what uh, <clears throat> St. Bonaventure and later John Henry Newman would call, especially John Henry Newman, the notion of, of the individual and conscience and then conscience representing, because I'm finite, a voice of a being who is my own cause and must be being itself as cause of all other beings. And this is, this is shorthand, but St. Uh, Saint John Henry Newman calls this the, simply the two luminous beings. And this is, this is really where the critical question comes, is that <clears throat> given 
I have all of this abstractive sensory knowledge. And given that I'm not the source of this knowledge, <clears throat> do I say, well, actually, there is no explanation, and thus I kind of top out in terms of explanatory possibility in my own understanding. And then you have all of the skepticism of Descartes, the, um, the uh, deontology of Kant, the, the distinction between the noumenal and the phenomenal in Kant, or perhaps the uh, subsumation in terms of imminence of Hegel uh, moving to Heidegger. And so when you, when you, when you <clears throat> try to explain the reality of experience, sensory and um, abstractive experience, in terms of purely natural causes, you top out at a finite subjective cause, but a subjective cause because it's not the explanation of its own activity that falls upon or ultimately ends up or goes off the rails in terms of doubt and despair. This is, this is essentially what St. Bonaventure says in the Collations. If you don't <clears throat> resolve uh, through the personal, through the image, you can never see in the image the source of that image. This is the itinerarium, the two stages of every step, through and in, through and in. <clears throat> and the, the insight here that in terms of natural philosophy is that then there is a judgment based upon evidence, and especially the principle of sufficient reason, that my own subjectivity is not the cause of subjectivity itself or that knowledge. And so by dint of sufficient reason, there must be... be um, a sufficient reason or a cause that explains my own subjectivity and thus my experience of reality and by extension, reality itself outside of me. And this, this act of judgment is not something that is able to be justified or achieved on the basis of natural causes alone, abstraction. It presents overwhelming evidence, but it doesn't force the ascent. Why doesn't it force the ascent? Because you can redefine God as uh, St. Bonaventure says in the first question of the De Mysterio, in ways that don't uh, actually match up, formally speaking or metaphysically speaking, to the essence of God as that than which nothing greater uh, is or can be conceived. If you define God in a limited way and start importing uh, finite and especially fallen psychological or even physical characteristics to that God, of course you can deny that that God exists and you may never make even a partial resolution to what must be the case about perfect being for my own subjective being to arrive at any knowledge as such, particular or general. And so the, the issue is then for um, St. Bonaventure and uh, Newman, and this is what Father Peter, Peter's bringing forward, is that there is the problem of the personal and subjective, the act of judgment. And this act of judgment extends beyond the, the bare natural evidences that are presented in abstraction. So, so what is this? Well, it postulates that in the Bonaventurian uh, mode, it postulates some different mode of concursus as a principle of sufficient reason and in an essential order, not accidental order, that my very being as rational must depend upon and be related to in a relation of dependency upon a being that's higher causing my being to be rational in both its first act and its second act. God creates this being as rational. And as I act rationally, moving from abstraction to its complement and making judgments, I am also dependent upon that being. So this is what Bonaventure calls divine illumination. Scotus um, <clears throat> makes it a bit easier, but loses some of the richness of the language and the um, immediacy, although Scotus affirms it elsewhere, the immediacy of that unique concursus with the image as a natural power um, of, on God's part, as well as um, the, the, uh, the, the continuing action of divinity in relation to created personal agency. Uh, nevertheless, the, the, the idea is similar divine illumination and uh, univocal concepts are both used as a postulate based upon the fact of experience and the need to explain how we arrive at certainty that extends beyond the, the punctuated and individual and the ever-changing. And so 
again, what I'm what I'm pushing towards here is the fact that then the issue of judgment is at the center, and this judgment culminates in the realization, according to Newman, of two luminous beings, myself and God. And for Newman, as well as for Scotus and Bonaventure, but it's very clear in Newman, uh, that the voice of conscience is something reflecting within me, speaking to me, and reflective of a voice that is not my own, a voice that I have to answer to. And so this judgment, this judgment based upon sensory evidence, experience, natural processes of reasoning, this judgment, while rational, is a kind of rationally ordered leap beyond mere mechanism, because it postulates that there are persons involved and that there's freedom of choice. And so judgment then becomes an issue of humility and assent on the basis of the fact that I'm not my own principle. And I have this voice of being and morality that speaks from within, even if that voice is muted, even if it's distorted. And so <clears throat> Father Peter would then call, following Newman here, is that the, the critical question resolves then how do we arrive at a state of natural faith as opposed to supernatural faith? And this natural faith is the assent or judgment that there is a being, A, me, I'm personal, but there's a being that explains me who is also personal. Why? Well, because I'm personal, whatever explains me must also be personal because it's going to possess as my cause any perfection that, that I possess. And so it's going to be personal in a higher way. So this is, this is then establishing that the personal subjective aspects of knowledge are resolved not primarily in a justification of the act and process of arriving at knowledge through abstraction on natural terms, that would be in a sense circular. And this is why Kant says, ultimately, we can't do it. We have to, we have to posit a distinction between the noumenal and the phenomenal. And we then imply uh, categories that are postulates to govern our thoughts and actions in order to be scientific. And this is because he sees the problem, the circularity problem of using the very faculty that you're and analyzing and making a judgment about to establish the rectitude and certainty of those very judgments. And so <clears throat> he says it can't be done. But interestingly, interestingly, um, in this instance, he's saying there is no explanation. So I make a choice for this explanation. And this is not much different structurally to Aristotle saying, well, I can't actually explain um, the beginnings of creation, because there is no creation, there's just necessary eternal emanation. I can't necessarily explain generation and corruption as having a temporal starting point. So I will just say um, that the, the cosmos as we experience and the process of generation and corruption through forms and accidents in terms of substance is just eternal. This is always happening. And that I really can't explain the individuality of the the um, rational animal. So we just have a unity of an agent intellect. But none of this, this is, this is an inferential postulate that actually goes beyond the evidence, but it's a way of explaining the evidence. And that's a choice. I want an explanation because everybody has a drive for arriving at some knowledge of the principle of sufficient reason. And this is what Bonaventure would call um, in its natural mode, a resolutio semi plana, a semi a semi-complete um, resolution, a resolution to general causes, general statements about being, about the way things are. Um, but ultimately, apart from Christian revelation, you can't arrive at that. So whereas Aristotle posits eternity and necessity, Kant posits uh, a distinction and a split between the phenomenal and the noumenal and a certain kind of approach to knowledge and then ethics on that basis. But here's the interesting point is that at this point, both Aristotle and Kant are no longer simply commenting or operating within the realm of natural processes. There's a positive stance. There's a choice being made about how I'm going to explain what I've just explained in a more ultimate sense. And there's, there's some irony in this fact that while both are trying to establish science and both presume in a sense the, the priority in this explanation 
of natural processes, natural causes, natural modes of activity. Nevertheless, when they give their ultimate explanation, they tip their hand to what their presupposition, their operational presuppositions and procedures must be. The priority of the person and judgment. And so Bonaventure just simply says, and Scotus follows, Maximilian uh, follows, that no, the, the, this issue ultimately isn't about justifying natural activity. Why? Because natural activity doesn't explain itself. And our very engagement with natural activity um, manifests that not purely natural agents are at work. There are voluntary agents and voluntary causes. Newman will say famously, well, perhaps not famously, but very fittingly uh, in one of his letters, what you call causes, I call effective wills. And this is, this is very important because this, is, this gets to the heart of the Franciscan tradition, the relative priority of the will as that which is most distinctive of personal actions, as opposed to intellect, which is a natural mode of activity, <clears throat> and thus the resolution of the critical question is a choice. It entails a choice for personhood, actually two persons, myself and God, as Newman would say. And so this is where we arrive through judgment through this illative, ascent, this illative sense being brought to bear on an act of ascent, which is relatively simple, a simple action of the soul that is not identical, though is conditioned in many ways on all of the processes of, of, of abstraction and uh, discursive reasoning. That act of ascent is actually what establishes us in a position relative to an object. But that act of ascent is rooted in the will based upon an assessment of the data. And so natural, natural faith is just simply assessing that data in a partial revolution, rev revelation, excuse me, resolution um, with respect to there being two luminous beings, myself and God, and God is manifested internally through the voice of conscience. And this is used, or this is applied analog analogously to explain our understanding of the created order in its own uh, realm of discourse and inquiry. So <clears throat> for, uh, for, and this is, this is easily supportable in uh, the Franciscan framework. Why? Well, because they already believe of the real identity of the soul and its powers. And so thus intellect is simply not going to ever operate apart from volition, apart from memory and um, memory will never not manifest itself in intellect and through intellect volition. But really that point of arrival in philosophy is a kind of natural faith in the reality of personal being and agency. And it's manifested in the very assent or judgments about the natural order of things and the, the proper ordering and understanding of purely uh, natural causes. Natural causes as um, needing an explanation on the basis of personal or free causes. <clears throat> so uh, then getting into the context of uh, uh, Colby in a Bonaventurian, the Bonaventurian theological vision. And the, the, the main points I, I want to make here, I've already made is that uh, Colby understands this kind of dynamic relationship between uh, memory, intellect and will and the relative prioritization of will in relation to memory. And this is based upon his uh, thoroughly Franciscan anthropology. The specific Bonaventurian framework then gets carried out in the analysis of the modes of theology, namely symbolic, uh, proper or academic and contemplative. How do these relate? Well, they're, they're appropriated to the, these, these, these aspects of memory, intellect and will, of hope, faith and charity, all of these aspects. But the, the key point is though, is that all of these differences or distinctions we can make in the different ways in which theology can be approached, they're to not be approached in terms of isolation or opposition. There is a beginning, a middle and an end, and they work in a kind of inexistence or, or reciprocity while maintaining that taxes, just like the persons of the Trinity, just like the powers of the soul. And so this, this, there's this kind of distinction, unity, distinction, and through distinction, and, be, and because of distinction, order. And so Colby's always keeping this in mind. 
And so that order goes from hope to, to faith to charity. Charity is the purpose, and charity is the form of all theological uh, forms of virtues. Charity informs and makes alive all the other theological virtues. Hope and faith can exist without charity, but charity can exist without charity. And clearly, charity can exist without hope or faith, but charity is the reality. So there is a distinction and an order, and Bonaventure and Scotus are slightly different on this point. But the fundamental reality is that all of this is ordered to establishing union in love. Why? Well, because the Father is love, because the Father um, through the Son spirits the Spirit, and that love is extended in the Spirit in a Trinitarian manner to the economy of salvation. So uh, what are the uh, particular, yeah, go ahead. Um, could you comment for a moment on the issue of mystical theology? Because I know there's one way of approaching this um, that, that we saw recently in a papal address that sort of views the mystical as, and I think this is based off of some comments from uh, some other brothers who have studied at the Marianum that uh, the idea is the mystical sort of gets into this uh, people trying to express with the limits of language, you know, some incredible experience. And so basically, like there's a, uh, a certain excess in language that you sort of have to take with a grain of salt. Mm-hmm. And um, so I'm not sure how they would fit this in, but I know that specifically when Colby's languages come up, the response is, well, that's mystical. But I think yeah, the way I, that, that I, responds it is, is, they're sort of saying like, if you want to know who someone is, you know, don't read the love letters that were written to them because you know, they're not going to, you're not going to get uh, a letter of reference based off of um, a love letter written to them because you're you're not dealing with a literary context where you're you could say that has a uh, I don't want to say well, okay I think I think yeah. I understand what you're but yeah. I think I understand what you're saying um, and we later on in a, in a slide later we will come to this again we will revisit this but this this pertains again especially to the the relationship between the powers of the soul and as the powers of the soul are mirrored and appropriated, perhaps, um, to the modes of theology. And I will just simply say here that like this notion of analogical concepts, this understanding of mystical, as you framed it, in terms of uh, the limitations of language, is simply reducing the mystical, it's, 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 it's misunderstanding the nature of the mystical as knowledge presenting the object of love to the will to a question of how do we analyze linguistic and thought structures? And it's a complete mistake. And so people here in this mode of discourse um, oftentimes think mysti mysticism is simply a mystification of concepts and language because our language can't capture the objects to which we, we can refer. And I, I, think, I think this is not at issue with, with uh, the Franciscan tradition. For the Franciscan tradition, mystical union or mystical theology is ultimately the fruition of knowledge presenting the object of our love to the will. Knowledge making present the object of love. So there's acquired and infused mysticism. Acquired mysticism, still <clears throat> the, the rational, natural, natural, not rational, natural modes of thinking are occurring. I'm thinking through the revelation of Jesus, whether in the creed or in the sacraments, I'm thinking through these things. And in prayer, I'm contemplating this through the operation of the Spirit. And the Spirit is operating from within and without. Christ is teaching me from without. Christ is in illuminating me from within through faith. And then the Spirit is operating or cooperating synergistically to arrive at this contemplative enjoyment of the truths in a, a um, propositional mode or form that are presenting that are presenting to presenting to the will lovable objects so there's an acquired contemplation of course a, comp a contemplation in this instance exceeds the mere rational formulations 
because the rational formulations of any kind don't capture the reality that they're indexing. I can't capture, I can't capture an atom with any kind of um, verbal or logical formulations. They exceed my ability to speak them, but nevertheless, I can speak truly about them and index them. And Blessed Duns Scotus makes this very clear that <clears throat> language is of, of such a power that, and Scotus is here too. This is the issue with assent. How do you assent to something that you don't have a strictly um, correlative amount of evidence for? This is the question of Locke. Locke. You know, how do you how do you go beyond sense experience and have make a sense to faith? It's irrational because we don't have evidence that's coextensive with the nature of our ascent, and thus the object we're assenting to is unknowable in this relevant sense. There is no there's no purposeful statement here. It's just it's just a willful act that's fideistic, irrational. Uh, Scotus will say that well, actually, language as ephatus as spoken, while not measuring up to the realities that are being spoken. There's an apophatic mode. The reality is not my word. Nevertheless, language, especially terms, theological language, particularly in terms of indexing or referencing, pointing to a reality, can do this. It can extend beyond. So there's a true indexing power of language, especially revealed language. Like when we say Father, or we say Son, or we say Holy Spirit, we say Trinity. Our language truly points and only points to that reality. But of course, our language can't measure up to that reality or capture that reality, especially in one train of thought. You have to have multiple trains, and even those trains don't add up to uh, perichoresis. <clears throat> and so uh, the, the issue here is, is one of confusing the limits of language and the apparent antinomies or incompleteness, the apophatic moments that we all arrive at with mystical experience itself. And I just say, this is just simply a mystification of language. This is not mysticism. Because mysticism, in terms of acquired, it's through meditating on the revealed truths that who gave it, well, that, that were given to us by the one teacher of all, Christ. He came down from the Father, John 1.18. And so he gave us the very words to index that Father by, and he gave us the Spirit in the church, which is maternal, obviously then implicating or bringing into the discussion the role of the Immaculate Conception as primarily mediate, mediator in order to be mother, <clears throat> he gave us those very words to point back to the Father. And so he knows, like Bonaventure will demonstrate in question four of the De Scientia uh, Christi, the, the disputed questions on the knowledge of Christ, Bonaventure knows that Christ knows what it's like to be God, but he also, because he's God, he, he knows what it's like to be perfect man. So he knows what words work, what words don't. And through uh, reason recapitulated and re-established on faith. If you don't believe, you will not understand. But if you do believe, obviously, um, the 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 the, the uh, contrary would be implied. <clears throat> that uh, there can be an approval of reason on the basis of the application of philosophical uh, concepts and tools to theological language. And this goes to the question again of exemplarist metaphysics being recapitulated into the analogy of faith, which is primarily typology, the relations between persons as anticipations and persons as fulfillments, persons and events as anticipations, persons and events as fulfillments. And then ultimately typology as witness to terminates in sources. And sources, again, are free agents, free personal agents, and the primary personal agents at stake here are Jesus and Mary, and all the patriarchs and the whole of salvation, salvation history. But it's through types, through the revelation, the witness, the memory of scripture, that we know about the persons, and then we can invoke the persons through <clears throat> revealed language, revealed prayer, and the, the liturgy. So I think, I think this notion of mysticism, even at the acquired level, is really a confusion, and, and uh, you know, I'll make enemies here, but it's, it's similar to this, this whole notion of not the analogy of being, but the, these, this notion of analogical concepts. This, doesn't, this is nonsense to me. And people think that mysticism is basically ambiguity in our internal ephatus, our internal conversation that we carry on in ourselves. I say that's not mysticism, that's just confusion because there's no such thing. God is not the author of confusion. Now, of course, <clears throat> there are very uh, sophisticated ways of trying to explain this, but <clears throat> when you uh, described certain comments, 
that this, this is based upon the inadequacy of human language. Well, no, the inadequacy of human language is built right into creation. You don't have to be a mystic to know that human language is inadequate to, to measure up and uh, coextend the realities that are being spoken of. I mean, to me, that's just a non-starter. That's just saying, let's just quit the theological project and then, you know, punt to uh, the cloud, the cloudy unknowing that uh, clouds our intellect and thus our charity. And then, you know, to finish this piggyback, to piggyback on this, when we say we move into the, uh, the cloud of unknowing in the relevant sense, you know, the, the uh, St. Gregory of Nyssa, when he reaches the top of the mountain, uh, the Holy of Holies in the temple, this cloud, this is not saying that intellect as such or knowledge as such ceases when you, when you, when you achieve or you're gifted with rather infused contemplation. No, this is a, a, a supernatural act occurring to you wherein the finite modes of thinking, namely abs abstraction, uh, discursion, ceases. But knowledge doesn't cease. Why? Well, because the essential quality is of knowledge, the essential form of knowledge, as Father Peter states in chapter three, is the making present of the object of love to the will in the most perfect possible way. Well, infused contemplation <clears throat> is this foretaste of the beatific vision and Franciscans and uh, Paulomites and other people alike say, well, this is equivalent to the beatific vision. You're wrapped to the third heaven and you're, you're, you're undergoing or experiencing in a punctual sense, be it beatitude itself, because this is an infused contemplation wherein the object, namely God, is present to the will through infused direct um, knowledge in, a, in in its most perfect mode. So yeah, we're not going to be we're not going to be talking and discursing through words because we're already at the end of this process of talking and discursion. But it doesn't mean we're not going to have, um, in a relevant analogical sense, we're not going to have the word of praise or the act of charity because why the father generates a word, but we can't we can't speak that word. And so whatever whatever kind of word the father generates that is his son, we will be in that ambit ambit of speaking. We won't be we won't be uh, in a sense abstracting and arriving at a concept and then kind of carving it off and then saying, well, we got a word here. There's another word. No, there's it's it's this ever speaking. The sun is is semper infieri. The, the, the sun is always not becoming in the grammatical sense, but he's always being generated. The father never stops speaking the word like we, when I just spoke the word, word, I'm done speaking the word. So my words are not infinite. So of course, language isn't going to measure up to uh, reality, but, uh, but, it, but it doesn't follow that um, language is no good or useless in the, the, the areas of philosophy or theology and that language, especially revealed language, uh, doesn't truly index or point to their, their references. So when I say God the Father, I literally have no adequate idea apart from the grammatical structure and the removal of limitations of finite fatherhood um, in relation to infinite fatherhood. I have literally no idea what that means, but nevertheless, I truly invoke him and point to him infallibly when I say that word. Why? Because that word was given by our Lord himself, the one teacher of all who came from and is in the bosom of the Father. So uh, I don't know, that's a, that's a longish explanation, but uh, it, is a, it is a type of a, a reply <clears throat> in terms of what mystical theology is. So when St. Maximilian is making claims, um, just like St. Bonaventure in um, the Itinerarium, he's not, he's not actually, well, like St. Paul too in Corinthians, uh, he's not actually um, annotating or transcribing his uh, experience of infused contemplation. That's a contradiction in terms. So when you say that's just mysticism, well, of course he's not, he's not experiencing his, his rapture, his ecstasy. I mean, he's not transcribing it for us because we're not in that state. It takes, it takes one to know one in terms of the perfect mystic. And so what he's doing is again, through the, through the proper mode, rooted in the symbolic mode, he is transcribing in a theological idiom what ultimately must be experienced and can never be adequately described. And it's, it's just the, the highest um, 
degree or point of perfection of this kind of experience. And this is the point, this is the whole reason why we're created in the first place. Remember, according to Scotus, and get back to the Bonaventurian framework and the Scotistic colorations, the absolute primacy of Christ and Mary, Christ through Mary. And we've talked uh, previously about the, the, the double typology, Mary as uh, uh, both Virgin Earth and New Eve. This is essential. You need both sides of this equation to understand the full mystery of Mary, especially in the Colbian sense of immaculate conception. Because immaculate conception is ordered to be mother of God, but immaculate conception indicates that in terms of the return, the reditus from the Father through the Son into creation and then creation through the Son, the incarnate Son back to the Father <clears throat> and in the Spirit, the, uh, the, 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 the reditus or this, this understanding of immaculate conception is in order of efficient causa causality prior to the final cause of divine maternity. But immaculate conception then already, already indicates that she is both term of Israel's covenantal mission to bring forth Messiah, but she's also term of the good creation. And so metaphysics and history are being united and um, centered upon the immaculate conception, the immaculate conception as spouse of the Holy Spirit. First, <clears throat> first term in the order of recreation, and then first term in the order of um, the economic sending of the spirit. So she has this double relation and the, the order of creation, immaculate conception is recapitulated and situated in the status of queen mother spouse in the church as subordinate co-hierarch though with the son. But the immaculate conception then is becomes an inherently mediatory concept because she's mediatory, just like the, the, the Holy Spirit is appropriated as mediating the activity of the Son in creation, so Mary, in, as immaculate, is mediating the operation of the Spirit in order what? As mother, as mediate, mediator, to give birth to the head, and then members of which she then becomes the first member <clears throat> at the birth, at the cross, and then at the, or the conception at the cross, so to speak, and then at the birth at Pentecost. These are these are very important aspects, but the, the 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 this was all about mystical theology. But I'm getting back into the scotistic framework. Is 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 that the point then for creation? Is that we all become mystical theologians? We all become mystics in the sense of infused contemplation, and that's what we all will achieve in beatitude. Is we will all become perfect mystics. Why? Because our knowledge and our love will be so perfect that we will have the object of our love presented directly to the will. And this will not do away with knowledge. It will just quiet or put to sleep the, the finite modes of, of knowing and thinking. <clears throat> and uh, if, we're all, if we're all created to be mystics, well then of course this opens upon the primary purpose and we know the primary purpose because it happened. God willed, the highest fruition in a finite nature, first, that would be ad extra, the highest enjoyment of himself ad extra, and thus by that fact of enjoyment and that perfection, the highest glorification of the Father and the entire Trinity ad extra. Ad extra. Well, this is Christ, and Christ came through Mary. So if we're all called to be mystics, that's because Christ was the perfect mystic. Why was he the perfect mystic? Because he was willed from eternity to be <clears throat> the perfect worshiper and perfect enjoyer of the divine essence in a created nature. So God willed at extra, highest fruition, highest glorification, and then he built up a nature as rational, but also as essentially media, mediat mediatorial, uniting uh, sub-rational and purely rational, namely, you know, things below a human being and things above a human being like angels, uniting them in one nature in order to unify all of, uh, all of creation and bring all of creation in and through Christ uh, back to the church. And so for, for the, 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 the key points here, though, with uh, the scotistic colorations that St. Maximilian brings to bear on this generally Bonaventurian framework are the absolute primacy, the immaculate conception, and um, a willingness to employ 
and a readiness to employ <clears throat> in addition to notions of divine illumination to understand that within a more philosophical idiom of uh, the univocal concept of being. But the, 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 the point here is that Colby brings forward these scotistic colorations in order to bring out the full scope and uh, the full realm or range of implications that uh, St. Bonaventure was working with. And so in a sense, Scotus truly is the perfecter of St. Bonaventure. And then St. Maximilian understands this <clears throat> not only in terms of the terminus of theology being a movement from the symbolic through the proper to the mystical, and then in the mystical, the acquired and infused, but also to the application ecclesiologically through the Franciscan order's unique mission to rebuild the church of carrying out and continuing the cause of the Immaculate in terms of the first and second page, the definition and then the incorporation. So contemplation and mission then have this um, dynamic relationship, whereas mission designates the purpose of incorporation of the Immaculate and all of its uh, implications and contemplation being the purpose. But you need to be a contemplative in some sense to be a good missionary. And St. Maximilian was both of those. And so there's this dynamic uh, interrelationship. But the, the, the mission aspect is the incorporation of the Immaculate into the life of the church <clears throat> in order that everyone be contemplative. Well, St. Maximilian was already a contemplative when he uh, began to understand the unique relationship uh, of, the, of the Franciscan order to the cause of the Immaculate and the Immaculate's own unique relationship by appropriation, not in terms of a proper identity as you find in the word, uh, in the incarnation of the Son, to the, uh, to the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and so contemplation and mission are, are um, not just applications or colorations of Bonaventure by Scotus, but they're also, somebody, somebody is doing something on the chat. Let me see here. That's fine. God bless. Um, <clears throat> It's not just an application or a coloration of Bonaventure, it's also uh, an extension of SCOTUS in a real sense in terms of the mission of the church. This is this notion of incorporation. But then this notion of incorporation is filtered back into a proper understanding of the three modes of theology. How do these things relate? Well, theology is ultimately that we may love God and neighbor. It's ultimately practical. And so the ultimate purpose of theology in its proper sense is to mediate between memory and charity. And this is the process of, of um, gaining wisdom. And so the proper, the, the theology in that second mode, the proper mode, the academic mode, is has its has its purpose in serving the broader mission of the church in terms of uh, establishing that true uh, generation of spiritual men, as St. Francis would say, meaning contemplatives, both acquired and infused. <clears throat> and going back then, hearkening back to the question of then um, the framing and resolution of the critical question and this notion of deudicatio or judgment. Well, judgment itself is, is something, even in natural faith, that exceeds and is not explainable purely by formal logic or inferential processes. It's not explained by purely natural processes. So it, it requires a person and the person engaging that act demonstrates the reality intuitively. Like uh, Scotus would say, uh, certain things are intuitive. The knowledge of being as such, that to which essay is not repugnant. That's, that's something known intuitively. The, uh, the states, the internal, my own internal states, those are known intuitively. And all this means is evidently unmediatedly, even though I formulate a proposition about it, my knowledge of it is immediate. Okay. And so this, this understanding then of, of deudicatio takes into the account, we make a judgment about the fittingness of an explanation. So ultimately the, de, the, the issue of judgment on the natural level, whether you want to go Kant, you go Descartes, you go Hegel, you go Heidegger, um, <clears throat> you go Bonaventure, you go Thomas, D.U. De Cazio, even on the, in the realm of natural faith, is an analysis of the fittingness of this order and my judgment about that fittingness. 
And the difference, the upsourcing that Christianity has, especially as articulated in the Franciscan tradition, which I think corresponds radically to the patristic tradition, both, both East and West, is the, the, the understanding that the way to resolve these philosophical issues, these metaphysical issues, even in the natural realm, while certain knowledge is necessary and does happen, there are many pagans that have certainty, many atheists that have certainty, but the account of why there is certainty always goes through the person. And if it goes through the finite person, it has to terminate in a recognition of an infinite person, an infinite person that, that's the source of my own judgment, my own uh, intellectual enlightenment. And so <clears throat> what, what is being postulated here is judgment is related to a fitting explanation. Why is this fitting? Well, because I can't prove through rationality, rationality itself without begging the question. And if I prove through rationality, rationality itself, I'm saying this is self-evident. But I say, yes, it's self-evident, but it's not its own source. And so you can immediately infer there must be a source, right? But this is not any, we're no longer in the realm of, of, of purely formal logic. You're saying there are necessary conditions, but all the necessary conditions you're recognizing are being mediated or routed through the created image and the natural processes. And through introspection, I'm recognizing that, oh, there must be these conditions, but yet I can't prove rationality through rationality. So I make a judgment about the fittingness of an account. And the fittingness of the account in terms of natural faith is that there is a God. And there's a humble submission at that point. And what do I, what, what comes in here? It becomes a choice in humility to seek this source that I'm seeing speaking to me evidently in the voice or through the voice of conscience. But yet I can't through purely natural means say that, you know, I can describe the source. No, there's a voluntary aspect. There's a choice being made to explain this experience this in a contemplative way through the contemplation of being or to explain this experience through other some other model and so this is the issue deutecatio and decuit are intimately related and so the decuit is ultimately the 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 term of our judgments but what's the most decuit decorous decuit well that's the story of the incarnation and the incarnation is clearly motivated and rational there's evidence for it but nevertheless, just as in natural faith, as Father Peter's arguing, um, so all supernatural faith. There is a relative step that's taken beyond just the formal logic, the material evidence, the historical evidence, to say, I assent and submit and I seek union with this, with the persons who gave this story, and ultimately the Father who sent this person to give this account. And so there's a, there's a certain privileging of the, the Christian metaphysical analysis that's perfectly in conformity with processes of abstraction and general things we can say about metaphysics. But nevertheless, there's this important aspect of the decuit over the potuit, the decuit, the fitting, judging what's the most fitting explanation. Uh, there's a certain priority over just what's possible. And Father Peter will come out and say that in the Franciscan framework, the, potu the potuit, especially in theology, is not the primary subject of inquiry. It's actually what God did and what he revealed and what's been authoritatively preserved and taught in his church throughout the millennia. And the potuit's function at this point is basically to avoid intellectual absurdities, like contradictions. You can say something is not fitting if it's not possible. <laughs> That's an easy one. But because, because of the contingency of cr the created order and what God has concretely willed to manifest about himself, we're only ever experiencing what is fitting in terms of God's ordered willing. And I think, I think the, the, the Book of Wisdom is very helpful uh, around, around chapters uh, 12 and 13, because uh, amazingly, the, uh, the Hellenistic Jew Jewish author gave an account of ordered and absolute will and also, if you read the Septuagint, it doesn't come through in the Latin Vulgate, but the Septuagint version, we actually have analogy of proportion in the scripture. Uh, I think it's wisdom 13, 5 or 8. Um, read, it in the, read it in the Septuagint because the very word is uh, analogia. And I, I, will just, I would just suggest or submit that when you actually think, though, about the, the just a, a, a normal syllogism, um, the, the famous one, all men are mortal. Socrates is a man, 
Socrates is mortal. What you have is a universal premise. All men are mortal. That's a universal premise. That's second intention. That's a statement about logical structures. Because there's, there is in reality no all men, except in the mind of God. It's a universal. It's a second intention. Why? Well, because more men will exist, and men have existed in the past that don't exist. But then you say Socrates is a man. Well, is that right? Well, judging by all the evidence, he's a man. All these, all these things fit. So Socrates fits all the criteria of a man. So what? The conclusion is Socrates is mortal. But what the interesting thing is, is you have a major premise, which is a, a universal statement. You have a minor premise, which is a particular statement, a particular statement that engages the faculties in the second act of the mind of composition and, and division about which you have to make what? A judgment. You make a judgment based upon composition and division of the relationship between Socrates, his humanity, and thus his mortality. But that judgment is, a based upon, is based upon what? How things fit together. You're judging the fittingness of the minor premise. And through even through syllogistic reasoning, purely formal logic, there is an aspect of the decuit. The decuit is unavoidable in human activity. So we're making judgments about what is fitting. Now there's clearly an inbuilt tendency we have to presuppose this just like there's an inbuilt tendency to knowledge this is not an issue but it's i'm trying to show that i'm trying to clarify that even in purely formal logic rational inference there still is an aspect of decuit especially in matters that that pertain to concrete situations where you're making judgments and applications of general rules to the particular there takes there takes an aspect of prudence of uh what uh newman would say the illative sense uh, a recognition of fittingness. And so this, 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 this begs the question of, you know, what is virtuous decision-making? Decision what do we call the true prudence of the mind, intellectual prudence, as Newman would call it? Not just, not just practical prudence, like what I'm going to do, but intellectual prudence. How do I make judgments? All of this is being brought to bear. And the, 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 the postulate here, the revealed postulate here, is that Christianity gives us the best story because it's the true story. It's the one story. So it, there's a unique privileging that is given to Christianity because what we have is the God-man himself speaking to us. And so this, if, if it were true, and this is evident, there would be strong motive to believe it. And because it is evident, there's um, convincing motive to assent to it as a better explanation in the, in the abstract but as a concrete way of living in the personal, interpersonal. It's better than what uh, Kant or Descartes or Hegel or Heidegger have to offer because it explains more. It's a better story and it pertains to concrete persons. And we have the miracle of, this, of sanctity in the church, the perdurance of the church, and we have then the life of the sacraments. Um, and so there's a certain kind of deutacatio judgment on every level and the decuit are intimately related judgments are about fittingness judgments are about uh there's a certain kind of aesthetic aspect to it beauty as a transcendental there's a certain kind of harmony proportion pleasingness to judgments it's not irrational but what, what is it's simply just an admission that i'm not god and that we're wired to see things that are uh in harmony and proportion beauty suggests truth now we can get into a broader philosophical question uh, and discussion about what beauty is, but but that's that's neither here nor there in this context. I'm just, just trying to lay down the principle. And so I, there's a certain kind of go I ahead. Something in. Yeah. I was wondering about this, like because you hear two lists of transcendentals often: you, unity, truth, goodness, or beauty, true and good, or true, good and beautiful. Now I was thinking that maybe yeah. you could say, I mean, this is just a pithy observation with not much thought behind it, that beauty is truth returning to unity, or no, that truth returning to unity through goodness. Mm -hmm. Because you, you see these two lists, and one of the questions is, well, where does beauty fit in? And whether it's more of just an, an 
aesthetic approach, but I was thinking that maybe you could put unit beauty in like the, the place of unity, but instead of as the point of departure, it's the point of arrival where you go from the one to the true, to the good. And then through the knowing of the, through the knowing of the good, you return back to the unity, but now it's sort of a, a unity in beauty. I like, yeah, I like that. The, uh, I think the difficulty, and I, I, I don't remember exactly, um, one true uh, good, and then you have uh, being. It seems like something like this. Now this is terrible, I just wrote this, but that's how kind of I imagine it. Now these are, this is just a, a, a schema of transcendentals. So obviously being is the first concept. It's the first, it's the transcendental of transcendental, so to speak. And so being, we, we get the concepts of being, of, of, of one true unity, truth, and goodness from being itself. But I, but I think that harmony and proportion gives a rise in this kind of um, transcendental epiphenomenal moment of this notion of beauty. I don't think we can have beauty without unity, without truth, without goodness, because we can't have harmony, proportion, and delight. Um, and so I think I think St. Bonaventure kind of talks about beauty. Some some scholastics, many scholastics say beauty is not properly a transcendental. It's just kind of what is on the receiving end of, of, of the created experience of these transcendentals. I think Bonaventure, it's it's more of beauty is kind of the the flowering, the the bubbling over of unity, truth, and goodness as they manifest being. And so uh, beauty kind of like perichoresis in the Trinity is a kind of catch-all term for unity, truth, and goodness. When you have true, when you have true unity, you have truth and you have goodness, you have beauty. Just like when you have father, son, spirit in existing, you have perichoresis. And if you want to say, if you want to say Trinity the best, God and three persons, say perichoresis. And if you want to say being uh, unity, truth, goodness, say beauty. I mean, I think that's in some sense how Bonaventure is acting. And then beauty serves as an interface manifesting truth and goodness from a source in, in, a, in a unified way of, of these uh, decoit judgments, these judgments of fittingness. And I, I, think that's, I think that's relatively close to what Bonaventure might say, especially in the uh, itinerarium, but it's, it's, it's a topic that I, I can't uh, discuss at, at length other than to speculate. But I think, I think when you talk about the transcendentals, it's a great thing because they're all correlatives. <laughs> You know, there is a certain kind of logical order to them, but you can talk about all the transcendentals together if they're if they're if they're um, exclusive transcendentals. To to uh, to uh, if they're well if they're pure perfections or purely divine transcendentals, you can talk about all of them together, and they become mutually illuminative in a kind of great hall of mirrors or a great uh, mosaic type of image. That helps us. That help that that are reflective of each other. You know, I learn more about goodness by reflecting upon truth, and, and I learn something about truth when I think about goodness. And when I think about these things together, you have a beautiful um, collage. You know, uh, light, light and reflection. I don't know, um, but the uh, yeah, I, I I think that's a good point. Uh, so the 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 deco it is a judgment about beauty. And it's a judgment about fittingness because fittingness and beauty are closely related concepts. Um, <clears throat> and then finally, the upshot then with the Bonaventurian scotistic framework is that it's simply a, a contradiction in terms to speak of an autonomous created soul. An autonomous created soul, well, we've already talked about uh, the, the natural faith, the two luminous beings of myself and God. Um, we've already talked about divine illumination and the unique mode of concursus, of dependence for rationality in first act and in second act upon the creator. So there is no such thing as an, an, an autonomous created soul. And because of the unity of the powers of the soul, memory, intellect, and will, they're not absolute attri uh, attributes or accidents. They're formally distinct modes of operation of the one soul in one person, there can't be an autonomous natural order or, or an autonomous philosophy that considers things purely in terms of natural or logical explanations. 
there's always a, a volitional, personal aspect. And so there's no autonomy to the created soul in this absolute sense because it's created. And thus, there is a reality or an understanding of Christian philosophy. Because Christian philosophy, theology and philosophy, Christians reflecting philosophically, don't simply prescind from their faith in the revelation of the Trinity, the incarnation, and the economy of salvation when they do philosophy. They make a distinction. But at that point, the distinctions are methodological and apologetical. But still, their philosophy is going to be informed and perfected from within by their faith. Because faith provides a full resolution of what philosophical questions are trying to answer. If philosophy gets us to being and perfect being, revelation and faith gets us to triune being. It gets us to person, it gets us to incarnation, uh, uh, the church and salvation. And so Christian philosophy is really the dynamic engagement with what Bonaventure would call a semi, a, a resolutio semi plena, which gets us to the notion of being and a first perfect being and a resolutio plena, which gets us not only in the perfection of knowledge to a Trinity God, creation, incarnation, salvation. It doesn't get us just to that, but a full resolution is the, the, the through the operation of the Holy Spirit, bringing us into concrete interpersonal relation with that Trinity. So a full resolution of our philosophy and our theology is loving union. This is the Franciscan vision. But it can, it can keep all of these components distinct in terms of explanation, but say all of these components ultimately in perfect act are found in Christ and Mary. And what are Christ and Mary? Well, it's the full personification of a created nature by assumption, namely hypostatic union. And it's the full, um, or yeah, it's the, and it's the full, in a sense, unification or humanization, I should say, of a created person with divinity in uh, the Immaculate Conception. So we have the perfectibility of nature in union with a divine person, and we have the perfectibility of created person in um, the union of charity between Mary and, and Holy Spirit. And so you have perfection of nature and perfection of person in both of those revealed truths, revealed realities. And so, yes, there is such a thing as a, a Christian philosophy. And in fact, Christian philosophy is the true philosophy. Um, there's a book that just came out, which I found very helpful. I don't know if I've mentioned this to you guys. Uh, this book right here, can you see this? Anyway, it's called The Rise of Christian Theology and the End of Ancient Metaphysics, Patristic Philosophy from the Cappadocian Fathers to uh, John of Zama uh, Damascus, and it's written by Johannes Zakhuber. I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly. It was just published this year by Oxford. And uh, an interesting takeaway is that uh, for the, for the uh, church fathers and for the ancient pagans viewing the fathers, uh, Christians were viewed as philosophers, and Christians understood themselves as philosophers. There was no um, systematic hard fast distinction between theology and philosophy why because philosophy was simply the love of wisdom and a conversation based upon all the data you have and accept about that one reality that we're sharing and so uh i think i think saint bonaventure is the clearest most most faithful uh follower of that early patristic vision uh in the western church today because he's able to distinguish between natural modes of operation and supernatural modes of operation uh natural revelation, the book of creation, and supernatural revelation, the book of scripture. He's able to distinguish all of these things and order them methodologically and also formally and ontologically because they are different. But he doesn't make a hard and fast separation or admit the separability of faith and reason, theology and philosophy, uh, as certain other systems do, because, well, he understands, again, the unity of the the soul and that would imply 
and is revealed uh, a certain unity of the orders of nature and grace, especially in terms through Scotus, the finality of creation, which again is ultimate and perfect fruition and glorification. And so there's an intrinsic finality of supernature to nature in terms of intention, in terms of divine freedom and uh, purpose, even if there is only an obediential potency to that end on the part of the creature. And so, you know, when, uh, when Christians are talking about homoousios or um, one, person in, uh, one person in two natures, they're dealing with revealed content, but they're also dealing right in the wheelhouse of philosophical inquiry. And so they're speaking directly to Christians, but also to pagans about the nature of reality. So Christianity, um, in some sense, can be viewed as the true philosophy uh, and theology as the perfection from within of, of theology. And of course, Bonaventure uh, writes this over and over and over again. You can just look at basically any of his works in volume five of his Opera Omnia. <clears throat> and Scotus uh, holds the same because he affirms the absolute primacy of Christ uh, and uh, the later Scotists with their uh, predestination and one in the same decree, they, they affirm basically the same. There's, there's a purposive, intentional, volitional order to the supernatural in creation, creation as such. The supernatural is not in the pejorative sense uh, accidental to nature. It's not something added on as a second tier. No, it's the perfection from within of the purpose and possibility on God's part and on the creature's part, respectively, of why, <laughs> why there's something rather than nothing. Um, <clears throat> and then let's see here. Uh, let's get, so this is, you know, we've, we've, we've talked a little bit about this. You can look at this. And I think, I think all of this will be fairly transparent, given what we've already said about the, this, what I'm talking about, the second mode of theology, its relation to metaphysics and to um, revelation, to, be, to, be, to its relation to memory and to uh, will. And the, the important part here is contemplation of being as the start of theology, not um, punctuated finite experience. So instead of making judgments about punctuated experiences, we're contemplating, contemplating the reality of being that is at the heart of all of these individual experiences. And through this contemplation, we arrive again at those two luminous beings and the voice of conscience. <clears throat> uh, secular philosophy is a dead end. Um, I would recommend, because we're I think we're running short of time, looking at um, pages. This is, this is an important section. Looking at pages 63, to uh, 66, that, that's a very important section on uh, what we've been discussing about Christian philosophy, the Resolutio Semi Plena et, et Plena. Uh, it's entitled From Partial to Full Resolutions, the Three Modes of Theology, because what this will do is it will, it will bring, into, bring together the relationship between intellect and will, uh, philosophy and theology, and the order of the various modes of theology within themselves. So symbolic, proper, and um, contemplative. And this that's a very helpful section. It's basically a summation of St. Bonaventure, but St. Bonaventure keyed to the absolute primacy. And really, the absolute primacy is the key to completing the synthesis of St. Bonaventure. And so with SCOTUS, you have further distinctions and refinements, but St. Bonaventure, in terms of structure and methodology and approach, provides the, the, the main pieces of the puzzle and the main statements about the nature of rationality, uh, the nature of uh, creation and its purposes, uh, those, those aspects. Um, and so if we have, if we have a certain uh, scotistic coloration in terms of refinement and um, clar clarity of, of, of expression and the affirmation or recognition of the absolute primacy and the immaculate conception. If we have a certain scotistic coloration of St. Bonaventure, we have an, a Marian accommodation of Bonaventure by Colby. And this is, this is really uh, an application of Bonaventure's theology of history in the Collations and Hexameron as 
understood precisely in terms of two things. Well, three things. One is Mary as the, the spouse of Holy Spirit, F Francis as having vocation to rebuild the church, and uniquely in Franciscan, the cause of the Immaculate that begins especially with Duns Scotus, the cause of the Immaculate and its two pages. And so from the very beginning, there was a unique understanding of Mary and Holy Spirit with St. Francis, and there was a unique vocation, specific vocation given to St. Francis to rebuild his church. And that was extended, and this applies to the entire church, so it's not just Franciscan. Franciscan is uh, what, uh, a vir totus uh, uh, apostolicus et catholicus. So he's a true Catholic and apostolic man. He's not just his own thing, and the Franciscan order has a mission that it carries on in the name and in spirit of St. Francis to rebuild the church. And the particular inflection is the mystery of Mary Immaculate. Why? Well, because she provides the key and she is the mode, like Hopkins would say, be thou my atmosphere. She's the atmosphere and mode of the reception and um, incorporation and application of the teachings of Christ in the church especially the sacramental life. So there's a certain Marian accommodation by Bonaventure uh, on the part of Colby, and it's especially his theology of history, as I've just explained. Um, and then finally, um, I think we should, uh, I think we should stop there and we can pick up next week. I think there, there probably are questions, but I, the, the main purpose is, is here. And I think in order to in order to appreciate the Marian components, you're going to have to read the chapter along with the considerations and comments from Father Peter on the question of how Mary fits in. Well, we've, we've discussed this quite a bit, but it's, it's always good to review because this chapter really presents in a fuller way a lot of the moving pieces, the conceptual apparatus of Colby's thought as he's bringing forward Bonaventure and Scotus, and especially as synthesized and fleshed out by Father Peter, who knew the sources uh, better than better than Colby did, in terms of all of the implications and far-reaching um, treasuries that were that that Colby was recipient of, re recipient of in the the natural or, or intellectual mode, where he might not have known, he might not have been able to footnote all of all of those. So. Um, I think I think we should uh, pause here for for uh, questions, and then we can pick up we can pick up later. I, I know that uh, Fra Joseph and maybe uh, Mr. Kellogg uh, had some questions too, because I just I talked a whole lot <clears throat> this this lecture. Yeah, I did have a one question pertaining to the um, the you know, the scotistic maxim, I guess, the potuit de cuit ergo fecit. I remember mm -hmm. reading from uh, von Balthasar and his, uh, believe it or not, his theodrama when he had the prolegomena to Mariology. And uh, he brings up that uh, potuit de cuit and ergo fecit. And I was familiar to it because of my reading of Father Peter and being taught by him, et cetera. But I noticed he had a, von Balthasar had more of a critical stance towards it. And he's talked about, I guess, well, from his perspective, how in history it's been abused or can be abused in terms of like, at what point does fittingness, um, at what point can I, I guess, ascribe fittingness to a certain revelation of God uh, without it being, I guess, unreasonable. Um, and so I noticed that I, I disagree with him, like in, in, in his critiques, like he even critiques St. Louis de Montfort as being exaggerating too much in the way he speaks about Mary. So he seemed to have more of a, a minimalist tendency. And I don't think he understands the decui in the way that Scotus does as being ordered and rational. I think he would tend to think that hey, the, the decui can become arbitrary or voluntaristic or whatever. How would you, how would you respond to that? Like, how would you, you situate that the decui is not something arbitrary, that it's something that's, it is ordered, fitting, beautiful, and it actually pertains to the truth of revelation. It's not just something you make up. 
Well, yeah, I think, I think in the first place, it's helpful to uh, recognize that the decoit is, is, is another way of analyzing fittingness or, or beauty. And that is a process that occurs in virtually every um, human action. There's a judgment about fittingness. And so the basis uh, or the basis for rationality in terms of uh, natural judgments are, let me see here. I must have, did I, I stopped sharing screen. Okay, good. Um, the basis of rationality are scientific inquiry, um, custom, um, social norms, mores, laws, those, those issues help us to judge the fittingness. So there's a certain kind of evidence. There's an informedness um, with respect to our judgment. It can't be off the handle. If it's off the handle, you're a crazy man. You're, there's a, or if it's, if it's only looking at a very partial, uh, in, uh, incomplete picture, it can, be, it can be unfitting. It can be purely formally rational, but it can be very unfitting. And so I think, I think the, the, the key to showing that the decuit is not making a claim about some arbitrary judgment is precisely through the analysis of what it means to make a judgment in any sense. A judgment is informed by knowledge. And the knowledge is collated and organized in the, 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 the best or most fitting possible way. And so we, we then choose to proceed or accept this uh, account or analysis. Um, with respect to revealed theology, now we don't in principle have access to the truth, truth themselves, because remember our theology is, is a theology that's practical and revealed. It's for the sake of, uh, of our salvation, for love of God and neighbor. It's in order that we may become good. But nevertheless, there is a contemplative or rather speculative aspect to it because we do reflect upon propositions, revealed truth statements. <clears throat> and we apply philosophical tools in a rigorous manner to try to unpack the implication, both uh, inferentially like this this, this conclusion follows from these premises and a further premise or conclusion follows from those. Or we can think in terms of lateral connections, like um, you know, there's a certain kind of lateral proportion between the um, temple and the uh, tabernacle. I mean, that's a pretty obvious one. Uh, so, so we can see those comparisons. The difference is, is that, so we can say, well, there's a fitting analogy between the tabernacle, the temple, and um, Christ, and the Marian aspect of Christ. We can make these judgments of fittingness. And the, the difference is, though, is that when we make judgments of fittingness in the realm of theology, we're still doing it in an informed way. But A, we're presupposing the symbolic mode, the authoritative teaching of Christ through his magisterium, the teaching from without, we're assimilating that, that and assenting to that while doing our reflection. So we're, we're reflecting within the ambit of the truth, already understanding that the conditions of our analysis are embedded within the church. And the church is one that is given authority. So we're always subordinate to A, the teaching of the church and the correction of the church. So we understand that our beginning and our end is not in ourselves. We're just the middle here. We're reflecting upon what we're, we're given in order to assist the church come to an end that may be um, beneficial, may advance the cause of Christ in the world, or the church could reject it and say, yeah, this doesn't work. I, I don't like this. And so the, 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 the decoit in this context doesn't smack or, or, or smell of any arbitrariness because it's just a matter of, again, recognizing our limitations within a prior existing context of authority and understanding that the purpose of our reflection is not to uh, establish our own opinion as authoritative, but rather present an account of revealed evidence in a way that seems to follow and that seems to shed further light on the um, revelation of Christ as such. And so I think, I think that's a way to analyze it. I mean, clearly, I mean, the, a problem with von Balthasar is I think he understood, understands it in a post-Kantian way, which sounds very arbitrary. Like this is kind of individual self-expression and I'm expressing myself and coming up with my own fitting explanation. That's clearly not the ambit of, um, or the context of, of Blessed John Van Scotus or St. Bonaventure. They're already presupposing a, an authoritative, uh, dogmatic and sacramental life of the church with a long tradition. And they see themselves as servants 
of of the bishops and hierarchs in the church as they um, go about carrying out their own ministry. Uh, von Balthasar, methodologically, I think he's given a lot to uh, Hegelian thought, um, and one, and so his his he's, he's he stands because he's so he was so erudite. He read everything. He's able to stand in a critical with a critical posture towards the entire tradition. But when you actually read his theo theodrama very carefully, it's interesting. He presents a kind of gestalt, a kind of a kind of fittingness, a decuit picture of the whole thing, but without a real thoroughgoing, robust metaphysics. There's no consistent metaphysics. And it's very clear that he, he doesn't understand Scotus because he doesn't understand Scotus on the will. But more importantly, and perhaps more devastatingly for von Balthasar and for uh, Joseph Ratzinger is they don't understand Bonaventure on the will because Bonaventure and Scotus are of one mind on the will. And both of them interpret Bonaventure as being a Thomist. And then they have a very difficult time uh, integrating St. Bonaventure, St. Bonaventure's aesthetic uh, emphasis into a generally Thomistic framework. And I think it becomes, uh, uh, there's, there's a, it creates a great deal of tension. And then I guess one final note is, I know, I know Father Peter reviewed some of the uh, works of Adrian von Speyer, or von Speer, I don't know how you'd say it, um, years ago. And I'm sure there's great merit. But in all fairness, it's difficult for von Balthasar to be taken seriously when the decoit of St. Louis de Montfort or a, or a, or a Duns Scotus is considered to be arbitrary or extreme or perhaps unmoored when so much of his theological vision and insight was influenced very deeply by a mystic that has yet to be recognized as being entirely sound. I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be neutral because I think there's a great deal of benefit, but I mean, it's, it's just kind of like, wait a second, you're criticizing Scotus, who's one of the leading theologians in history and saying that he didn't understand the implications of his own decoit. When you're taking, you're, you're, you're transcribing locutions from a woman with no theological training and you know, why you're, living at her house for years and I just think well yeah maybe maybe you're not being fair there and you know you should hold up a mirror at that point another rather than point, rather than criticize SCOTUS another point on this I think that Father Peter makes in his uh, Magistra Theologorum Mater at the, uh, yeah, did, he, he did might, not he's got completely a finished work it didn't seem completely finished um, yeah, that's the uh, Theologorum. Okay. Um, Mater et Magister Theologorum, yeah. I think he talks about this triad of um, poetry decoit ergo fecit. Again, as it's, uh, there's a perichoresis through the three moments. And so you're not moving from a direct poetry. You know, it could be, and it would be nice if it was, and therefore it is. But, and, and to bring in, uh, you know, we were talking the other day about um, Douglas Adams and there's that one in there about how there's this one planet with these dragons that, you know, there was a very beautiful description of what you did, what would happen if you did something to them and then people would do it to them and get horribly killed. And the response was, well, what's beautiful is true and what we wrote was beautiful and so, the fact that people <laughs> that people are getting killed doing it doesn't have anything to do with us being wrong. <laughs> but, <laughs> but anyway, so yeah, so it's not this a linear movement between the three points, but rather what you're doing is you're bouncing back between this potua and fetch sheet. And so one key, I think, in Scotus's work that freaks some people out is he's always dissolving connections, saying, well, you know, for example, well, no, the, the, the hypostatic union doesn't cause the anointing of the human nature of Christ with grace. It's fitting, but it doesn't cause it. And so what he's doing there, he's, he's trying to dissolve a causality that's not warranted. That's he's trying, yeah, the, the, the formal and efficient causality. Yeah, I think that's, that's an important point. 
continue. Go ahead. And, and, and so what he's trying to do with Potuit. So I think this is a, a criticism that's been advanced towards him is that he basically, he dissolves everything, the scotistic acid that just dissolves all these connections and you're just left with a bunch of voluntaristically affirmed points. But no, that's one moment. Then the other moment is the fetchy, that is the, the actual order of things. Jesus is the son of Mary. You know, we have a hierarchical church. These are sort of the facts. Mm -hmm. And then you're moving between these two to sort of acquaint yourself to the decoated. It's sort of like tuning an instrument where you go a bit above that's and a right. bit low. And, and so I think one way an image that I like that's a little bit less musical, but more in line with my own training is that you're by this process, you're trying to reverse engineer the economy of salvation to arrive at divine wisdom. That's right. Yeah. The signs of the divine will. Yeah. And this is, this is where he establishes metaphysics. I think this is, I think you're, you're spot on. Um, yeah. Go ahead. I mean, that, that's, that's what I had. Yeah. Oh, well, that's, yeah, I think, I think that's right. Um, you know, philosophically speaking, <clears throat> I think it's, 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 it's difficult to understand how there could be this solvent, uh, the, the scotistic acid taken uh, seriously, because Scotus has a very strong notion of remember univocal concepts. Un univocal concepts are very indissoluble. Um, he has a very strong notion of induction. He has, a, he has a extremely strong notion of induction. He says, if you ex experience the same kind of um, cause and effect over, over uh, a repeated period of time or re re repeated over a, a period of time, you can make a certain inferences, inference that inductively that this is the case. There is a causal relationship between the uh, cause and effect. He uh, has a very strong notion of intuitive cognition of internal states of affairs. And the, to really cap it all off is... The decoit cannot simply become arbitrary, even on the rational or on the natural level, because they're of the radical unity between memory, intellect, and will. Memory, intellect, and will, if um, used in an ordered manner, the decoit will never the net will never uh, simply jettison uh, the potuit and vice versa. And in the order of uh, theology, there is actually a, a great humility here is that the decoit is not being posited by Scotus as a necessary conclusion to a theological syllogism. The science for theology for Scotus uh, and for Bonaventure is not a subalternated science. It's not a science of inferences uh, along the, the lines of Aristotle. It's actually a reflection within a context of authority and sacramental life um, upon what's revealed. And ultimately, it's a coordination of biblical types and the key to understanding those types both in their reality but also in their coordination is the concrete teaching of christ so uh christ is the one teacher of all and paul is the philosopher for uh scotus for bonaventure and scotus and <clears throat> any conclusion theologically that's arrived at on the part of professional theologians or uh, mystical theologians is subject to the authority of the church and for the sake of the upbuilding and edification of the church and so the only problem with arbitrariness in terms of the decoit would come in the very uh, dogmatic constitution of the church itself. Can the church's authority dogmatically be arbitrary? And of course, evidence we would be brought to bear that no, it can't. Why? Because it's preserved, well, promises by given, given by Christ to the church and the, the operation and ministry of the Holy Spirit continuing through the church. Uh, so, uh, ultimately, the theological conclusions that are achieved through the decoit are subject to the ratification and approval and acceptance of the church. That's when they become binding and universal. Uh, uh, up to that point, just like any uh, theological project or conclusion or methodology, it's just uh, good insofar as it's good and helpful. And some are more helpful than others. And the, the, the usefulness of different theological systems and schools and approaches have been demonstrated by uh, their perdurance, I think, through through history, but that doesn't make them definitive in themselves. I mean, Father Peter at his last, um, he he won the John Cardinal Wright Award uh, for Mariology, I think, in about 20, 2014, 15. and he uh, 
he wrote a paper. He wasn't able to deliver it, I, I don't think. <clears throat> no, actually, I think he might have delivered that one. Uh, but anyway, he said at the end, basically, here's my position and here are my conclusions. You don't have to accept them. So Father Peter understood very clearly that what he's giving is a theological account, but that theological account has only as much authority as the account itself has, which is contingent and can only become dogmatic or be recognized as part of the deposit of faith on the part of the hierarchs, the, the bishops in union with the Pope. And so um, there is no possibility for uh, a truly arbitrary decuit unless you're distorting it and miscontextualizing uh, the system itself. But I think, I think the anthropological and theological and metaphysical analyses of Bonaventure and Scotus are so strong that it's hard to avoid a recognition that the decuit, especially in theology, achieves a certain priority over the potuit um, in analyzing the facet, and then the facet being then analyzed in terms of the decuit. And then the potuit at that point recedes as a check to absurdity. And, you know, I guess I'll leave with one final comment is it's very clear the Franciscan tradition, al along with a lot of the fathers, is maximalist in Christology and Mariology. And so the principle with respect to that is they will ascribe as much honor and glory to Christ and Mary as revelation and church teaching can bear, so long as the church doesn't in its um, monuments of tradition, in liturgy, or in uh, conciliar or magisterial teaching contradict it. So there is a kind of methodological pre preference for uh, maximalism. But again, to me, that seems entirely fitting, given whom we're dealing with. And it doesn't seem to contradict what's revealed in scripture. You know, and when it does, yeah, you step back. So uh, that's the, those are some considerations too. But yeah, your your summation there, uh, Brother Charles was was excellent. If I can say something, um, studying at the university, the Christology and the problems of Christology, not only in the Franciscan tradition, but in the whole church then you have a very deep evolution of the Christology. So the, the topics are much more on this humanity, more than a metaphysical deal, uh, issue. So when the Franciscan Yamarion, for example, tried to put it in a very brand new theology or proposition for the church, it's very difficult to get all the proposition together because from we are talking about the Immaculate Conceptions, but the, the mystery that we have to understand and put light on it is the one of, of Christ. So it, it's all the recapitulation, metaph metaphysical view, historical view are um, inside of the mystery of Christ. And for the modern theology, it's, it's, this is a problem of creation and redemption and how it fits together. So the, the difficulty for us is to create a kind of synthesis within the Christology. But if you talk about the Franciscan way, then automatically, because of the position of Mary inside of it, and this is a question of mediation, it, it's something very huge to, to create or to elaborate, or, uh, as, I, as I think it. Mm -hmm. And and nobody has done it in the next last years, uh, apart from Father um, Father Ferner. I mean, but not he hasn't done it with uh, very including all all the all the modern Christology, all all the modern modern. I mean, in some ways, uh, all the present theology on Mary and. Christ and ecclesiology, I would say at the same time. So the vocabulary is very metaphysical. So I don't know, it's what we are trying to say is very, um, we, we have a, a good line, a guiding line, which is very, very good for, um, for creating a, a kind of shape 
or, or mental um, structure base but at the same time it's very hard to to create a um, kind of bridge with the nowadays theology it's very difficult and if you ask for mm -hmm. example some of the people are asking okay um, la daria to la daria okay what do you think about the um, transubstantiation in the immaculate so he will say no it's it's a wrong it's it can be approved um, by the church as something you put in inside of your constitution for example so so the greatest theologian, they will say, no, there is no way. We can't accept this for Maximum Court, this uh, mystical uh, approach on, in theology because they want clear concept. And OK, I, I don't know if I, I've been clear, but thank you. Yeah, I think I think that it there, there are clear difficulties. And I think one is. I think I think I would distinguish. Um, I don't think what we're dealing with here is theological discussion as such. I think it's a question of. I don't think I don't think we've arrived at that discussion. It's a question of paradigms and approaches, and then it becomes a question of translation, and <clears throat> you know you don't see you don't see many. Um, Neo-Thomists dealing directly with modern Christology, yet they're writing Christologies, and so I think it's it's difficult to say what is what is modern Christology as a genre. I mean, clearly it has a category that's put on it when it's published as Christology, but there are so uh, there there are competing sets of assumptions and different metaphysical. Um, approaches and presuppositions when these topics are being written about that I think creates problems in trying to navigate how, to, how, to, how does one deal with the Franciscan approach in conversation with Christology, ecclesiology, Mariology that's modern. Um, it's a similar problem and I'm not saying it's to the same degree and perhaps not even of the same kind. It's a similar problem one arises, uh, comes against when one deals with uh, interreligious topics. You know, you can't, you don't know, Islam or, or a Jew would say, you can't say Trinity. That's an unacceptable term. Well, okay, do you know what it means from within the system? And okay, you do. Well, now we can have a debate. But the problem here is that when people hear transubstantiation or they hear high Christology where Christ was, uh, he possessed the beatific vision, clearly that's, that has weaker biblical grounds. It's only um, inferential biblical grounds based upon a kind of typological reading and then the reception through the councils, but especially the fathers of, well, what must be the case if Christ really is the God-man filled with all grace? Uh, but from a historical point of view, that doesn't make any sense. Why? Well, Christ isn't fully human. If he if he had the beatific vision, he he wasn't really empathetic, and he couldn't enter into uh, historical space, time, and con uh, contextual situations. Um, <clears throat> but at that point, then you come into a question of, well, how do we receive tradition? How do we receive tradition? And I, I don't I don't have the answers to it other than to say that, you know, like uh, Joseph Ratzinger, when he was young, he worked with Karl Rahner early on. Right. You read You read in his milestones that he worked with Karl Rahner and then they recognized that they were simply he said this. This is Pope Benedict as Joseph Ratzinger. He recognized we were on different theological planets. And I think there's something like that going on here. And I think the confusion comes when you have pontifical universities and institutions that differ heavily in terms of methodology and assumption. I think, I think that creates a real difficulty that's, that's almost unable to be navigated from within. You have to you have to take uh, a, a, an approach that says, wait, let's look at the long view. Let's weight these authorities. Let's understand these things in comparison um, and, and make judgments. Uh, so I think I think at this point, a lot of us. A lot of us are living on different theological planets. And then the pro the, 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 the project is simply to say. A. 
let's do let's do an active translation. Let's try to understand what we really mean by this. But then that will lead us to uh, a further difficulty of, well, we have different accounts of what metaphysics is. We have different accounts of what the human person is. We have different accounts of all these other things. And so I don't, I don't know if there's, I don't know if first order, I'll say first order, meaning like direct intimate dialogue actually can go on because I think there is so many methodological differences between the approaches that, that it makes it makes first order dialogue difficult. But I think there can still be an attempt at appreciating the incompleteness of one system in comparison to the contributions of another system. And that's a positive engagement um, <clears throat> or approach. And then there also is the process of defending or explaining better, giving an answer like Peter says, giving an answer for why we approach things this way. And you explain why you approach things this way, and then we'll see where they, what, what, what's the more fitting story? What's the more fitting theological account or method? Um, <clears throat> because I, I, think, I, think, I think Pope Benedict, as Joseph Ratzinger said it best, is that there are many theological planets right now, and people are living on different theological planets, and they're kind of beaming in for sacraments. Whereas in earlier days, those planets became, and we found they, there weren't as much difference, but those planets, be, those different planets became, say, you know, I'm, I'm using an analogy, so forgive me, uh, the, the great church of the East, the Syrian church of the East, they became the Coptics, they became the Orthodox, they became the, uh, the uh, Indian church, you know, they, they became different churches. And I think in some ways, all of those different churches that separated have more in common with each other than some of these theological systems that are being proposed today. And I don't know how to fix that problem because again, I can see that it doesn't seem fitting to me, but I don't have authority. I'm not magisterium. And so this is up to the hierarchs to say, wait a second, these planets are like becoming, you know, rogue asteroids flying off into outer space. And I, we, they don't even, we don't even know how they fit in with the, with the tradition. Um, but for example, you know, the approach of, say, Garagou Lagrange to Henri de Lubac, they're, they're like much closer. They're like the Occamists and the Thomists in the university. Now, I'm not saying either is an Occamist, but they're, in the, they're on the same planet. They're in the same university. They're in the same universe. Whereas Karl Rahner or Skilobex, they're like, they're doing something totally different. They're not, not even in the same thing right now. And I think that's what's going on. So you have Thomism, you have uh, Alberta, Al Al Albertism, you have nominalism, you have Augustinianism, you have Scotism, you have all of these places in the same university. They're in the same planet. But now, even within pontifical academies and Catholic universities, they just have so many, so such a different approach to humanity, to dogma, to magisterium that it becomes difficult to say how we can even begin to talk. I, I would suggest that some of these people aren't doing theology, they're doing sociology on Christian topics. Some people are doing real work, uh, but I don't, I don't know how to resolve all those things, but they're, they're real questions. But I think, I suppose, I suppose my ultimate question is, um, what approaches are ro ro more robustly affirm the realities that we proclaim and we participate in the sacraments? And what approaches more robustly want to carry out the, the, the Great Commission? And so in some ways, the, uh, the fruit is in the tasting. I mean, the taste of the, the taste of the, 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 the pudding, the, the proof of the pudding is in the tasting. So I would say, even if we can't get into the inner mechanisms, we can sometimes say that I don't really like the way some of these things are going. So maybe there's a better explanation. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a great question and we can talk about it at length. But I do think from a philosophical point of view that the, uh, the Bonaventurian scotistic position has something to recommend it. And methodologically, it gives a certain primacy to scripture. And I think that primacy to scripture can be extended even 
into areas of critical research. You know, critical research within the ambit of the fact that all of this is contingent and all of this is structured and ordered to Christ. Um, and you're right, Father Peter didn't engage these, fi these figures. He did engage figures of his own day like Rahner very deeply. Um, he engaged uh, Bruno Forte pretty quite deeply, um, Lonergan, people such as those. But I think, I think what needs to be done with Father Peter in order to kind of carry out the mandate of um, verbum domini and uh, dei verbum in theological methodology and what Pope Benedict called for is there needs to be a, a movement from prolegomena like anthropology, development of doctrine to a, a kind of biblical canonical engagement of the or, of, or a Franciscan biblical canonical engagement of the scriptures fleshing out how the the methodology of typology of scripture and the fathers actually is manifested in the franciscan tradition so it's it's not abstract i mean the franciscan tradition is very concrete but some of the language is abstract that's a function of patristic and scholastic uh philosophy and theology but let's engage and re re reconnect with scripture uh that's that that that's something that needs to be done and in this sense then you can say, you know, how success you can you can evaluate how successful that project is, without having to go directly into a discussion of philosophical uh, and theological presuppositions with other approaches. So, yeah, I, I'm sorry I don't have a clearer answer for that. I don't. No, know. it has been very clear for me. Thank you. Any 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 further observations? There is a book Questions? by Father Thomas Joseph White. Um, I think it's in just a moment. The Incarnate Lord. Yeah. So in it, he tries to um, basically put the Thomistic tradition at times more specifically Thomistic, at times more generally scholastic in conversation with post kantian um, theology. He basically says there's two main threads, one from Schleiermacher and one from Barth, both of which are trying to deal with the Kantian critique of metaphysics. And he says, ultimately, there, there are two extremes that in a way meet. And so he's trying to repropose a theological metaphysics or a metaphysical theology and show how it can both accommodate for the insights you find in thinkers like Rahner, Schleiermacher, um, von Balthasar, Barth, but then at the same time, so it both answers the, the valid points they bring up, but also goes beyond them. So it's, it's a very interesting book. Yeah, I think, I, you know, my a difficulty with that is that it, that kind of project cannot, in the minds of the critics, engage the, uh, the, the different Christological approaches on their own grounds. I mean, Bar Bart and Sch Schleiermacher are not exactly household names in methodology even. I mean, everybody knows who they are, but nobody's, there are a few Bartians uh, today. They're, you're, you're having individual works of Christology based upon you know, uh, social theory or you have biblical works. And I think, I, think the, I think the way forward is not to try to repropose right out front, the, the uh, theological metaphysics. It's actually to manifest in a novel-like form. I'm not saying write a novel, but show rather than tell. Manifest the theological metaphysics in the actual scriptural text as being articulated and received. So you're trying to deeply engage the, the biblical text because I think, I think we've got so many disagreements on methodology and philosophical assumptions that we're just we're, we're repeating the same conversations and kicking the can down the road until we go back to a direct engagement with the text and say, look at what came out of this, what best comports to a canonical interpretation 
of scripture according to uh you know the better scholarship i think i think i think that's because nobody cares about theological metaphysics if they're not already on the team you get my point i mean i we obviously do here we say they're essential but i think the way to move forward is showing how theological metaphysics are manifested in types and that the best reception of those types come in the patristic tradition and then you have different inflections in scholasticism you have different syntheses and bring those bring those forward so i think the paradigms of covenant temple uh those issues are what are going to be helpful for for bringing forward this vision of uh, saint maximilian franciscan theology and you find it going on in earlier theologians so yeah i, I I, I I think it's I think it's a difficult project. It's a it's a it's a large work. I mean, one one goal after I get the uh, collected essays published is to actually try to follow the model and outline of the Breviloquium, but engage the uh, Franciscan theological tradition in a kind of a, a biblical canonical account. This is one of my desires, is to move through the topoi of theology. Uh, in a biblical theological way, actually just showing how the there's a certain kind of mirror function that the the biblical imagery manifests conclusions best expressed or reflected back upon scripture in the Franciscan tradition. It gives the it gives the best picture and you arrive at insights into the Immaculate Conception, the primacy of Christ and the uh, reality of the church sacraments and so on. I think that needs to be done. And you have uber types or ur types in um, scripture, like covenant, like um, the Adam and Eve typology, like temple typology. All of these things are there and ripe for analysis on, on, a, on a typological basis, which is kind of the basis that uh, the fathers took from scripture is, is primarily typological because that's how Paul and Jesus interpreted the Old Testament. <clears throat> All right, well, I think it might be good to, to wrap up. <laughs> yeah, it's been long. I, it's been a while. I'm sorry we went so long. It's been, but thank you, uh, uh, Fred, Fred Joseph. I have, I did get your questions. I did read that little article. Maybe we can address it at the beginning of next time. Yeah, could be good. Okay. 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 So that, that then, you can even prepare for something for us, um, explaining us Newman views because I've never heard nothing about him personally. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if if it, um, if it fit, fits with you, but with the quit fetch it. No, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We. I think we. I mean. I think. I suppose we covered a little bit of that earlier before you came on, but probably okay. not explicitly. So you know. But sounds good. Let's uh, let's pray a, a glory be, uh, Fra Joseph. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was, as it in, was in the beginning. Yes, and now it's the world without end. World without end. Amen. Mary, Queen of the Universe. Pray for us. For us. Well, thank you. Thank you all. Until next time. Thank you.